We've spoken about uh, Khrushchev's domestic policies in terms of the um, de-Stalinization, easing of government censorship, easing of totalitarianism, um, easing of the government involvement in people's private lives. And so now let's look at the other side of the domestic policies, namely the economic. So in looking at these economic policies, the learning objectives are um, to understand the uh, methods that Khrushchev took in revamping agricultural and industrial policies of the Soviet Union. And I also want you to understand the successes and the failures of the policies and why they uh, mostly failed. And then to compare and contrast these with Stalin's policies. So one of the things is to realize that Khrushchev is trying to create a different Soviet Union. And um, how he goes about it in many ways is very is to dismantle some of the um, policies and institutions that uh, Stalin had built. And so you kind of need to look at um, what he was doing differently and why he was doing those uh, things. Okay. All right. And, you know, I like me some flowers. So I put a flower there for you because we're going to talk about the agricultura. So in looking at the Soviet economy, we know that Stalin left behind a greatly unbalanced economy. To be fair, um, there had been a massive industrialization of the Soviet Union uh, from the time that Stalin became leader. However, um, leading up to World War II and after World War II, there was a huge, huge, huge push for heavy industry. And what that meant is that there was not enough of an emphasis on consumer goods. So people didn't have access to the things that they wanted and or needed. We also know that this economy has um, created uh, issues of extreme poverty. So there were low agricultural prices set, so people in the countryside were very, very poor. Um, millions of people had been forced to move to the city and to work in these factories that sometimes offered low wages, not enough housing, not enough, um, especially in the wake of World War II, in um, so much of the country was destroyed, but we have not enough housing, not enough um, uh, medical, uh, all of the goods and services that people needed, that there wasn't enough of them. And so um, Khrushchev is going to attempt to address this, uh, this extreme poverty and unbalanced economy. And so for the vast majority of people, this ex addressing this issue would become the best aspect of de-Stalinization, that many people would see an, an improvement in their quality of life. And so one of the things that needed to happen was that workers needed to be incentivized to increase productivity. There just wasn't that much happening. Um, one of the things with, with salary caps, with um, uh, lack of profits being divvied up, there just wasn't any reason for people to work hard. And uh, uh, additionally, there, um, so there was uh, lowered agricultural prices, so the idea is that people could better afford their food. There was an increase in salaries, um, but the industry of the Soviet Union could not keep up with the demand. There was all of this stuff that people wanted and people needed, but the industry, um, the economy was not capable of producing it. So uh, if we take a step back and look at Khrushchev, um, Khrushchev was a real ideologue like he really truly believed in the soviet union and he really truly believed in in communism and he thought that the communism and the way the political system existed in the soviet union that these things were superior to what existed in the west and what the soviet union needed was an opportunity to really display that awesomeness now, mind you, um, this is the uh, the political system that he is believing in is one of a top-down approach, still um, heavily centralized planning, 
Um, so he's not like, yeah, 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 liberalization to the point of embracing capitalism. But uh, basically what he saw was that there were inefficiencies in the system and mismanagement of the system um, under, in the Soviet era, I'm sorry, in the Stalin era, which prevented it from achieving its potential. And so um, he believed that the, co the society that existed within the Soviet Union, these um, communist societies and economies were readily molded. That is that they could be easily transformed into uh, the system or it, it's to be modeled, molded and modeled into the ideal system. And Basically, um, what he thought was that after he got rid of his enemies, then he would be ready to sort of start implementing these um, economic policies, and the Soviet Union would be a real challenge to the West, to the rich Western countries. And so, part of that, like sort of like um, beginning stages of destalinization, was um, create like the stepping stones, creating the. Um, uh, the foundation upon which he could build his economic and uh, policies. And so his regime, that it was centralized, that it was a um, uh, single party, had great advantages to be able to make these things happen. And so what he thought is that by getting the right combination of incentives, of coercion, of encouragement, then the Soviet Union would be the best country ever. So all he had to do was to hit on the right combination, bam, 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 and winners up. So the worst, the one of the biggest problems um, that the Soviet Union was facing was that of the state of agriculture. So what I would recommend that you do now, and I know that all of you guys are perfect, perfect students, and you listen to everything I say is um, take a pause and go back and review uh, Stalin's agricultural uh, programs and the impacts. So those notes from last year, and this will give you a really good idea as to why the state of agriculture was in such a bad way. And you should also take a look at um, the lecture on the, um, that involved, that discussed the war economy and uh, that Stalin implemented during the war and then basically after as well. So agriculture was in a really, really rough place. And um, part of that was all because of the um, poor agricultural policies of Stalin. And there were famines and constant threat of starvation. So because the, of the poor investment in agriculture, then the threat of famine and not being able to meet the nutritional needs of the population was constant. Um, anytime there was a sort of like weather pattern, then they didn't have enough food reserves to be able to um, uh, address that. And so um, one a result, one reason why this was the case is because in communist ideology, the worker, the industrial worker, the urban worker was more important than the peasant. Because remember, it was the workers um, and essentially their alien the alienation from their labor that was the backbone of communism. And so peasants and those working in agriculture were treated incredibly poorly and there was limited investment. The first step in addressing that is that of peasant reform. And peasant reform is also going to obviously help to improve some of the issues that uh, exist within the agricultural sector. So in peasant reforms, uh, what they're going to want to do is reduce the income inequality between workers and peasants. This, of course, would help improve the lives of peasants um, and, of course, allow them to be able to afford some of those consumer goods as well. And so what they're doing is they're going to lower the collective uh, farm taxes and this is going to help incentivize the um, peasants, the workers on these collective farms, because then that means that they are actually able to earn more money because if they produce more goods, they're not taxed more heavily.
So then that money goes into their pockets and people can earn more through working harder and maybe people will work harder. Remember that the taxes in the collective farms was a method of control on the countryside. People who were a little bit further away from the heavy arm of the government. And so um, this they also they lower the taxes and then they're going to increase the prices paid to these collective farms on the gold goods sold to the state. So remember the only um, purchaser, the only person, the only group entity that bought uh, agricultural goods was the government, was the state. And so the state determined the prices and they kept the prices pretty low. The farmers had no options. And so now they're going to not only allow them to reap more profits, to keep more profits in their pockets, but they're also going to pay them more. This is going to help make farming um, a more attractive option. Remember, one of the things that happened is a lot of people left the farms to move to the cities, thereby reducing agricultural output as well. So now this makes it um, more attractive, keeping people on farms, and it also um, is going to improve the lives of the, of, of the peasants and incentivize them to work. But the thing with this is that peasant reform is great, um, but agricultural uh, improvements is slow, right? Because you work according to the seasons, um, and that means that it's going to take a little bit longer to see some of these great benefits. But it was slow but steady. There were gains being made. But those gains were not as great as um, uh, people wanted. And so Khrushchev is going to implement something called the Virgin Lands Program. And the idea here is to really, really um, maximize, intensify um, something, eyes, uh, the use of the land, thereby maximizing output. So the slow and steady gains on the collective farms and the peasants that already existed were not uh, good enough for Khrushchev. And so what he's going to do is increase the lands under cultivation. So lands that had never been used as agricultural land before are now going to be used as such. And so we have large parts of Central Asia and Siberia, and Siberia would be the Asian part of Russia, um, is now going to be used uh, for agriculture. And uh, unfortunately, one of the issues with um, in extending agriculture into these uh, virgin lands is that there is no infrastructure in place. So there was going to have to be a massive investment um, by the government into trying to establish some infrastructure. And by infrastructure, we're talking about no roads, um, no trains to bring goods to and from the area. Um, there are no like so you say stores selling um fertilizers the uh uh farm equipment so on and so forth and so there are a lot of campaigns like the image you see there to attract people to move eastward so the virgin lands program is underway and we kind of have to look at the overall success of it um you can see on the bottom this handy dandy graph of the acreage sown and the amount of grain produced and despite the increasing um amount of acreage being uh, brought under cultivation uh the amount produced uh, doesn't increase increase at the same dramatic rate but overall um there were some good beginnings to the virgin lands program but um, this is an area, these are areas of variable weather. So some years you have a lot of rain, some years not so much rain. So the cultivation or the bumper crop expected wasn't quite as huge as, um, as uh, Khrushchev predicted. And 
The other thing to keep in mind is that these virgin lands were not cultivated for reasons, and reasons being that they were either of marginal quality, so the soil wasn't as good as uh, other areas, or again, this variable weather makes it really hard to predict um, what your output is going to be. Now, there were some people who were grumbling about uh, this program. However, in 1956, there was a drought in European Russia, and that meant that the amount of food produced by the established farms uh, reduced. And Khrushchev was able to point to the agricultural goods coming from the virgin lands. So drought in Eastern Russia, um, I'm sorry, drought in European Russia and no drought in the Virgin Lands area. So um, in a way, they were able to save Russia. Now, other things that we can talk about in terms of this program is that transportation costs are much greater. So goods, um, that is the produce of these farms, have to be transported greater distances. And that means that the goods are going to be um, higher priced. So people totally recognize that the um, wheat coming from the East was more expensive than the stuff being produced more locally. And another thing that happened is that, uh, as we said earlier, the government is going to have to put a huge amount of investment into these uh, virgin land areas because there's no infrastructure. So agricultural machinery that was being um, produced was sent eastward to people on the virgin lands farms rather than improving agriculture in the established villages, the established farms, we potentially could have actually increased yields even more. Uh, after a few years, many, many people abandoned these farms and returned east. Um, it was largely the young people in like the communist um, youth organization which uh, moved east. And east people, they're far from home, they're far from accessing the things that they normally have access to because there is no infrastructure. There is very, very little there. Uh, and so people are like, bump this. There's no reason for them to stay, and many people turn east. So the government invested quite a lot into turning this land um, into cultivated land, and then in a few short years, uh, much of that land was abandoned. However, uh, despite all of the above, the lands continue to produce a large portion of the country's g grain, something like between a third to one half, depending what's happening um, uh, year to year in the east, and in uh, the European portion. In 1958, uh, Khrushchev is going to abolish the machine tractor stations that we spoke about previously. When the MTSs were um, first set up, they were important and necessary for the collective farms because they really, Russia at the time, didn't really have enough equipment to be able to completely switch over to mechanized farming. And so the MTSs, one, acted as a way to be able to provide a greater area um, access to machinery. But at the same time, they also were um, a political tool to control the countryside by Stalin. So by the time we get to 1958, Khrushchev is like, dude, we're done, we're good. We don't need any MTSs. Agriculture is good, collectivization is good. They can be done with. And so uh, the other thing that was happening um, is that the splitting of the sort of responsibility for agricultural production between the MTS and the, um, and the farmers led to a lot of inefficiencies. Um, this meant that sometimes the farmers couldn't be sure that the MTS would get around to doing the job that they needed when they needed it in time for other, for other processes to take place. So Khrushchev decided to do away with them and this would then um, allow for greater efficiency and increased production in the agricultural sector. Unfortunately, so it's not that so much that it was a bad idea to get rid of the MTS, um, but, 
The problem is, is that Khrushchev tended to be quite impatient. A lot of ideas, a lot of stuff he wanted to get done, not necessarily willing to follow the long haul process. So instead of phasing it out and giving the farms time to adapt to the new situation, raise the capital that they need to um, buy their own uh, tractors and farm machinery, no. Khrushchev did it in one. And this speed is going to be problematic for the smaller coal hosts, right? Because now they don't have the money to be able to buy their own to buy their own equipment. And that means that they have to assume debt. They have to go in debt to be able to try to get equipment. And so they abandon building projects. So things that would have been increasing the efficiency of the collective farms, they have to abandon them. The MTS workers did not want to become farmers. A peasant is the lowest on the hierarchy. A worker, an industrial worker, is higher up. So if they, you know, with the closing down of the MTSs, they would either have to move to the cities to maintain their worker status or um, join these collective farms, and they were most definitely not going to do that. Also, farmers made less money. So the result is going to be increased waste because you have you don't have people to repair the machinery, you don't have people to um, work the machinery, and so um, equipment just kind of sits there idle. And the result is going to be that uh, farmers can't farm as well as they could. So um, the coal hosey could not afford machinery, and the result is going to be a decrease in mechanized. Um, uh, agriculture and therefore a decrease in agricultural output so ultimately uh, people start reverting back to farming in the old-timey ways because there's a decreased mechanization in the countryside one of the things in terms of like how Khrushchev and a lot of the communists viewed things was the bigger the better so the smaller Kolhosi aren't doing so well so there's increased amalgamation into larger collective farms and into state farms. And in state farms, the peasants have even less um, discussion as to what's being planted. They have less uh, sort of like um, potential to earn. In the collective farms, you can't have your, I'm sorry, in the state farms, you can't have your own plots. So people can't sell extra and make more money. And so you have that very thing that the communists railed against. You have now the peasants are being alienated from their labor. Terrible. Here you have a handy dandy image of an MTS um, in 1955. So this was like the collective station for all of the um, agricultural uh, machines. And each one of these things is like, you know, product of heavy industry. They are expensive and jihigic. So we're going to take a quick look at what I call animal husbandry. But really, this is a story about corn corn because as you can see from this image uh khrushchev is looking ever so happy holding up an ear of corn because corn is awesome all right now one of the reasons why uh, khrushchev was so tickled about corn is because he himself uh is a peasant he came from the countryside and so he's really um focused on improving uh conditions in the countryside and for him, having that um, sort of mindset, and in a, in a, in a way, it, it is true, and this is what like sort of history has shown, for Khrushchev, the consumption of meat, dairy, and eggs uh, equals well-being. So wealth is connected to the amount of meat and sort of like stuff that you can consume. And so he wants to better the lives of people. He wants to dramatically increase this level of consumption. And that would be a reflection of how well the country was doing economically. In 1957, he announced that in a few years, in 15 years, something like this, you know, numbers, um, the Soviet Union would overtake the U.S. in, in meat production. He had uh, made a visit to the U.S., and one of the things that happened uh, agriculturally in the U.S. after World War II, there was a shifting of 
basically all of those industries that were producing stuff for fighting the war had changed uh, the industry and a lot of them went into farming. So you have the rise of what is called factory farming and which means that there is this massive in increase in animal um, production for food and the size of animals and so on and so forth. So, and a lot of that was based on corn. So he goes to the U.S. and he sees this massive increase and he's like, boom, we are going to do the same thing in the Soviet Union. And so this idea, though, is unrealistic because of collectivization on the farms. As we know, collectivization decimated the animal populations because people didn't have enough food. And then secondly, World War II also decimated animal populations. So and, you know, animals limited by biology. You know, like two cows are not suddenly gonna make you a hundred calves, but that's almost the way that he was seeing it. And he decided that corn was the best animal feed. And, and I guess it, it worked for the US, it can work in the USSR and they can do it better. Uh, the USSR has more land with which to plant corn. However, uh, planting corn in the Soviet Union was a failure. And this failure and the things that are connected to it is going to be one of the things that also helps remove him from power. And so corn doesn't grow well in a lot of places. It really just doesn't grow well in a lot of places in the Soviet Union. So despite the incredible amount of investment that the government placed into growing corn and um, money, time, effort, the yields were abysmal which of course means that you do not have the animal feed that you need. And so ultimately there was a decrease in animal production. Also, uh, there was a famine um, in the early 60s. So this famine, you know, you have a famine, you've shifted the production toward raising corn, you don't have the outputs, and now people are even hungrier. Okay. So this wraps up our discussion of Khrushchev's agricultural policies. I know you are waiting uh, for part two of economic policies, which is going to focus on industry. Toodles!